Good morning and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. So it appears that I am going back to Cornwall thanks to all of you guys. I really appreciate your generous support. I'll be leaving in a few days. I don't know exactly the time of my departure, but it's going to be happening really soon because the launch is going to be happening really soon and hopefully everything goes well. Okay, let's move on to the topic at hand. And there are a number of things, obviously, in regards to space flight, space science, whatever, and the way we do things that really piss me off. And one of the biggest things that just aggravates the hell out of me is the field of interstellar travel. Even though we talk about traveling between the stars as being this, you know, far in the future, virtually impossible, but, you know, maybe within the realm of our technological capabilities someday, that sort of thing, it just isn't true. We've known how to travel between the stars for more than half a century, considerably more than half a century. So what we're going to discuss today is an absolutely colossal ship, an idea that was conceived over half a century ago and yet is based on a very fundamental principle of fusion power, but not a fusion reactor, simply fusion explosions, which is something obviously that we've been doing since the 1950s and the concept has been around since far before that. The original idea upon which this starship is based is Project Orion, but this takes Project Orion to the next level. And if we could build a ship like this, and it is within, at least theoretically, our technical capabilities to build something like this, it would allow us to traverse the stars within substantially less than a human lifetime. And we're going to talk about all that in just a moment. This is Dr. Robert Duncan Ensman, and he was born in Beijing sometime in the early 1900s. He is a very mysterious and controversial figure. His father, if we are to believe the story, was an officer in Franz Josef's army, the Austrian army that is, captured by the Russian army in World War I, and then escaped from prison in Siberia by walking into China. His mother was a Johns Hopkins graduate on the Beijing Union Medical College staff. The British, wanting the Ensmans on their size of the next war, educated the children. Duncan Ensman attended the British Embassy School, which from kindergarten on exchanged students with French and German schools. He learned Chinese on the streets and English at the RAJ School. He was a very opinionated individual. Some people say that he lived for almost a century, although we can't even be very certain of his birth date. But regardless, his ideas about interstellar travel were astonishing. The Entsman starship uses the rather insane principle of detonating nuclear weapons, very small nuclear weapons, approximately 0.15 kilotons behind a pressure plate that would have shock absorbers in order to reduce the amount of acceleration exerted on the spacecraft, trying to keep it down to, say, 1G for the benefit of the passengers. That being the case, though, we're talking about one small thermonuclear nuclear blast 
every second or so in order to provide constant acceleration. The Orion, of course, only has one of these engines providing acceleration on one pressure plate, and in theory, this vessel can reach a speed of up to 10% of the speed of light eventually. Now, of course, there are very strict treaties in place about using nuclear weapons in space. The whole principle of using that many nuclear weapons on a single spaceship, of course, have dangerous ramifications if they were to fall into the wrong hands. But nevertheless, we have possessed the necessary technology to build one of these spacecraft and to travel between the stars since the 1950s, as you can see from this piece of content created by Asteronics. And by the way, their channel is linked in the description. I urge you to go and subscribe to their channel as well. In any event, this is a very simple concept based on very simple principles that we have understood for a very long period of time. And the Ensman Starship simply takes the principles behind Project Orion and supercharges it. That is to say, makes a much, much larger vessel with a lot more fuel and a lot more engines in order to deliver a lot more speed to a bigger payload. This is the idea behind the Ensman Starship. It is simply comprised of an enormous amount of frozen deuterium at the front end and the engines complete with shock absorbers and nuclear explosions at the back end. The number of engines vary anywhere from seven, as you can see right here, up to 24 engines with some of the larger designs. Dr. Ensman supposedly came up with the concept in 1964, however it only appeared in popular culture in Analog Magazine in 1972. As I said before, it is comprised of a huge ball of frozen deuterium fuel, 3 million tons worth, which would fuel nuclear fusion rocket engines contained in a cylindrical cylinder behind that ball with crew quarters also included. It would be longer than the Empire's State building. We're talking 600 meters long overall. The ball of frozen deuterium would power thermonuclear pulse propulsion units, that is to say, nuclear explosions one after another, similar to Project Orion, except a whole bunch of engines instead of just one. The spacecraft would, of course, be assembled in orbit as part of a larger project preceded by interstellar probes and telescopic observation of target stars systems. The rest of the spacecraft would be attached behind the ball as a seamless metallic fuel tank. The proposed method of tank construction would be to expand a plastic balloon in space and then coat it with metal. The spacecraft would be modular and the main living area would be comprised of three identical 91 meter wide modules, not 9 meters, 91 meters, and so it could function as an interstellar arc, supporting a crew of 200 people initially, but ultimately designed to carry 2,000 people, considering that we would be looking at a multi-generational journey. Now, in theory, this spacecraft if it had enough fuel, in other words, we're talking about a 12 million ton version as opposed to a 3 million ton version, could achieve speeds of up to 30% of the speed of light. This, in my opinion, is the most logical version of the ship that we could build, simply because it would allow the passengers to reach their destination within their lifetimes as opposed to their children or their grandchildren eventually reaching their destination. And by the way, these modules would be designed to rotate, creating artificial gravity for the passengers during the entire journey. And of course, they would be enormous. We're talking about a city-sized starship with a half a million cubic feet worth of living space. Harry Stein, a rocket scientist who did a lot of work on different types of theoretical spacecraft, described the ship this way, quote, the cylindrical portion is made up of three 
three identical cylindrical modules docked end to end. Each module is completely self-sufficient with its own auxiliary nuclear power plant, a closed ecological life support system, living quarters, communications equipment, repair shops, storage holds, and EVA landing craft. Each drum-like module is built upon a central core 50 feet in diameter and 300 feet long. Covering this backbone are eight decks of sub-modules, each measuring 10 feet by 10 feet by 23 feet. These sub-modules are used as living quarters, storerooms, laboratories, and recreational areas by the human crew. Each of the drum-like modules has 700 of the smaller sub-modules. And not only that, these ships were designed to travel in fleets of 10, not just one ship, and the whole intention was to transfer large numbers of the human population to other star systems to make us into a truly interplanetary civilization. The modules would be designed to detach from a spacecraft in the event of any sort of significant problem with the nuclear engines and then transfer over to another one of the ships in the 10-ship fleet in order to ensure that the entire population made the journey. By the end of the journey, in theory, including new generations that would be born on the ship, you would be looking at anywhere up to 20,000 new citizens of the human species arriving in a new solar system. This is an unbelievably ambitious task and something that would require an enormous amount of investment. But if you compare it to the amount that we spend, for example, on the combined military budgets of all the governments on the planet, something like this could definitely be built for a fraction of that cost. Now, of course, all of that deuterium would not be an easy thing to get, but Ensman proposed using smaller scale Orion type spacecraft, that is to say Project Orion nuclear spacecraft, in order to establish an infrastructure across the solar system to mine deuterium from places that tend to have large amounts of it. For example, deuterium tends to be pretty abundant in the atmosphere of Jupiter, along with many other locations. Eventually, the 12 million tons or so, and that's for the biggest version of this spacecraft, could be gathered throughout various locations in the solar system. Yes, it would take time. Yes, it would take money, but it's all within the capabilities of our current technology. We have everything that we need right now, both in terms of our scientific understanding and our technological sophistication to build something like this. All we lack is the will. But once we built something like this, where would we go? Would we go just to the closest star system to our own, Alpha Centauri? Well, that's not a bad idea, actually. Alpha Centauri itself is a star very similar to ours, both in terms of size and also probably has a planetary system of some kind, but also Proxima Centauri has a single planet within its habitable zone that might also be an attractive location to set up a colony. We're looking at a distance of anywhere from 4.24 light years to 4.37 light years. If our intrepid explorers decided to strike out for the closest star system to our own, if you include acceleration and deceleration times at 30% of the speed of light, it would take them roughly 15 years. In other words, enough time for their children to be tweens by the time they arrived at their destination. In addition to that, at 30% of the speed of light, there would be a time dilation effect, reducing the transition time by about 5%. Not huge, but it would drop the travel time by three quarters of a year or so by their perspective. Now, there are other possibilities as well. If Alpha Centauri doesn't look all that attractive, there are many other alternatives like Epsilon Eridani at a distance of 10.52 light years. 
years. This would take 35 years to traverse. You would take 5% off or about one and three quarter years because probably don't have sophisticated life, perhaps maybe bacterial life, and that's about the extent of it, which would make for very, very good targets for colonization because you wouldn't have to compete with any indigenous life forms. Now, there are other advantages to Epsilon Eridani. For example, it has two asteroid belts, two asteroid belts to mine for resources in order to continue the expansion process of the human species across the stars. Indeed, the original colonists who set off from Earth in the first place might decide not to disembark, but rather to continue their journey on their spacecraft once they were refueled and resupplied to new destinations with new generations of colonists on board until they eventually died in space. Perhaps this might be a more attractive fate for people who decided to plunge out into deep space for decades anyway. All of this, of course, seems very much like science fiction to us. Very fanciful, far too expensive, far too ambitious. We're never going to be able to get this done, right? Right? Well, here's the reality of the situation. If, after the Apollo program, we had decided to proceed to the next level, that is to say, going to Mars, and if we had used Orion Project spacecraft in order to accomplish that, we could have built an infrastructure spanning the solar system already. And having done that, we could have mined all of the necessary materials to build at least one of these Ensman-type starships by the end of the century. That is to say, the end of last century. All of these things could have been done by now if we had simply remained focused and kept our eyes on the prize. But of course, we haven't done that. After half a century of waiting after the cancellation of the Apollo program, we are only just now beginning to reach out for the moon again, whereas in theory, we could have been reaching out for the stars. That's something that got Ensman angry when he was still alive and it gets me angry to this very day. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, man, we are moving so quickly towards 100,000 subscribers, we just passed 93,000, having gathered another 1,000 subscribers in only 4 days. It's amazing. Become a part of the 100k sub club if you want my channel to continue producing content like this on a regular basis. As you can see, I plow this stuff out very regularly because there's just too much to talk about. Please check the description for various ways to support my content and for more information on all the things that I've discussed today and as always, stay angry about space!